Um, so hi folks, we've got a couple um, people watching. Look at that, 15 people already, terrific. We were just uh, you know, off chatting about books because that's what book lovers do is we talk about all the books we love and we just, you know, I was, I have a list of them in my head right now that I need to recommend. Um, but we are here with uh, Jen, uh, Jennifer Goshock. And first I'm gonna share my screen really quickly because I wanna just make sure um, everybody knows about um, the upcoming CAG-T conference and how to register and where you need to go to do that. Um, it's coming up on us so quickly. Can you guys believe that it's almost October? It's insane. Um, but right here on your screen, you should be seeing the CAG-T virtual conference. Um, it is going to be such a fun uh, new experience. We're you know looking at this for us with a silver lining and we have a great app um, that's really intuitive and going to be really fun for you guys to navigate. All these sessions, um, these breakout sessions and our keynotes are incredible and they're going to be able, available recorded after the fact. So if you're like me and you can't take notes furiously enough, you can go back and rewatch something. But please um, get on, log on to coloradogetcha.org and get your registration um, entered. And we are excited to see everybody virtually on October 19th and 20th. Mm -hmm. It's going to be awesome. And so, like I said, tonight we're here with Jennifer Gottschalk, and she um, works in Douglas County Schools and Advanced Academics and Gifted Education. Um, she's a writing specialist in buildings across her district and does professional development um, for her teachers there. She has um, been writing every day for 15 years, and she's published a young adult science fiction trilogy. And um, coming out with a nonfiction book on um, helping students um, with writing uh, that she'll share about the end of her presentation. And that comes out this spring. Mm -hmm. We're really excited for that. It's gonna fill a little gap there in our, our writing instruction tool, book, tool belt. And she has served in many capacities um, in the world of gifted education. She's been a classroom teacher, a gifted classroom language arts teacher, a program coordinator, and is the education chair of the gifted um, education uh, accountability committee i believe right yeah okay so we are super excited for what jennifer has to share i've got my paper and pencil ready be yeah. ready because yeah. it, this is a writing presentation so she may ask you to write something yeah. so get your paper and pencil ready and i'll turn it over to you jennifer all right cool i'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and i'm so excited to be here tonight so thank you marina thank you nanette um we're gonna talk about developing writing talent. And so welcome everyone, um, teachers and parents, and maybe some students and writers. I'm just thrilled to be with you tonight. Um, as Miranda said, this is a writing session. And um, if you've come to class with me before, you know that I, I give you a little advance warning, but I do want you to have everything out. I've got my writing tool book in my pen. If you type whatever works for you, just your favorite writing tools, or how I say in school is something to write with and something to write on. Um, uh, you already heard a little bit about me. I'm trying to think if there's anything new here. Oh, so um, as a writer, I have been a fellow of both the Colorado Writing Project and also the Denver Writing Project. And for all my teacher writers out there, this is just an amazing resource where you get to do class over the summer, usually um, here in Denver on your area campus. But um, for wherever you're listening, there are writing projects in almost every state around the United States and the other countries where you can come together with other teacher writers and really tune your craft and also earn graduate credit. Um, and then here's a fun fact about me. My first NAGC, the first time I presented for our national um, conference was about gifted writers. So no joke, this has been um, a focus of mine for a really long time. So I'm, what we're gonna talk about tonight is really kind of the culmination of a long time of thinking and studying and teaching and writing. Here are my books. Um, I do have this trilogy out. Um, I do write under a pen name, which sometimes people forget or, or like, I'm looking through books and Jennifer Gottschalk hasn't published anything, which is true um, until this coming spring. So this is my trilogy. And the one thing that's really special about these books is that they were selected for Bob Sini's list. Bob, if you're out there watching, thank you again. Um, these books are showing up on Bob's list um, in consecutive years of best books for gifted writers or gifted readers, excuse me. So that was a thrill, especially when he picked 
the first one out of a, you know, a needle in a haystack kind of. Um, okay, so this is your slide to remind you that we're going to write. So everyone get ready. And the next slide is going to be what you, what I'm inviting you to write about. Um, when you're in class with me, you can always write as long as it's okay for school. So you at home know what your rules are. But here's, here's the um, idea. So have a look at this picture and then there's some questions there for you. I'm getting out my notebook and my pen. And just take about two minutes and I, I promise to time us so that I don't lose track of time. And just, just let your thoughts go for a second. We're just doing as we are writing at the moment. We're writing just for about another 45, no, 35 seconds. Um, but we're writing to this prompt that's on the screen. finish your sentence or the phrase that you're working on. And what I'd like you to do, this is my sharing routine that I always use, is I want you to look at what you wrote and I want you to underline your favorite parts. So underline a phrase or a sentence or a couple of words that you're like, oh yeah, that was, that was my favorite part. Um, and then if we were together, so it's, it's a little bit trickier with Zoom, but I usually have people share in the chat their favorite part. And, and you can only share the part that you've underlined. Um, because what happens with writers is we always want to talk about, about what we wrote. We don't actually ever really want to read what we wrote. <laughs> so I try to like moderate that for students or for developing writers by saying, just share the part that you underlined. So I know Miranda can see the chat if anyone wants to feel brave and put some things in there. Um, and if not, that's fine too, because we don't know each other, um, or at least some of us don't. Um, I don't know, Mary, has anyone put anything in the chat when you're writing? Or not yet? I, I just prompted them to take a picture of their favorite or write it, type it in okay. there, a picture of their favorite um, phrase um, or, or part of their writing and then put it on, put it in the chat. So we'll wait a minute. We can kind of wait a minute. If you want to keep going and then I'll okay. come yeah, back. Let me know. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. So um, I know that true crime is on the rise, and some of you, that might have been where your head went when you saw that ditched bike on the path. Yeah, yeah, that's where you're at. Um, and this is me imagining that I am a detective. And here's my contact information. I'll have it again at the end, but I try to always put it at least one time near the beginning, because otherwise I will forget. So this is me pretending to be dressed up like a detective, and I'm thinking about writing. And I'm imagining that one moment in time, that frozen moment in time, that bicycle on the path is just that one piece of writing that I've gotten. And now I'm trying to figure out who, what's happened. And I'm thinking, is this a high potential writer? Is this an advanced writer? Is this a gifted writer? I've just got this one, just got one moment. Um, as I talk, I generally use these three terms and I want to just, I, I pick some detectives to help me remember who I'm thinking about. So Nancy Drew, in my mind, is a high potential detective because she could really, she has a lot of detecting, but she could benefit from some classes. She could benefit from some additional tools, like an upgrade in her tools. 
and she could definitely benefit from like some mentoring. To me, Batman is an advanced detective because he has tons of advantages. He is smart, he has money, and he has all the tech he could possibly want. Is he gifted or not? We're not sure, but we know that he is definitely using those advantages um, at, in his detection work. And then you have, this is a picture of Benedict Cumberbatch, the actor as Sherlock Holmes. And as far as anyone knows, Sherlock Holmes is just sort of made this way, right? So he's the person that just, the very first and maybe only piece of writing you got from him, you're like, wow, yep, or detecting. In that case, it feels and presents like gifted. We have, a, so, we have one from Molly Kennedy. <laughs> okay. But it was tired, just like teachers at the end of September. Oh! <laughs> Yes, yes, Molly. And then, and then Sally writes, no one was in earshot to hear her. Ooh, that gave me chills. Mm, see, I need to know what happened next. Um, right. My favorite part was, um, or that I wrote was, he kept darting after rabbits, dragging the bright red leash into the underbrush. The girl had to ditch her bike to follow. I like that. I, I wrote that. Um, as she stumbled over branches and vines, struggling to locate the source of the scream. Mm, yes, we're all, right. we're all in the crime right now. Um, and we're gonna talk, we're, not, we're gonna be talking about crime throughout our presentation tonight. So thank you for that. Um, so I was thinking about if this bicycle was all you know, we really don't know if a crime happened or not because we have no idea about means, motive and opportunity, which is the evidence triangle. Um, and, and what I've been thinking a lot about with writing is if I see writing and someone wants me to make a judgment, is this a gifted writer or not? If I don't know any of these three conditions, then I don't really feel like I have enough evidence to make a decision. So, sorry, of course. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, here's again, the evidence triangle. And, and really that's what I'm saying. This is about evidence. So I, I might know a little bit about the students writing life at home or at school. I might know if they're motivated or not. I might know where they have tools, but I need to know all the things to kind of get to that final uh, determination. And really tonight we're about developing talent. And so we're gonna look at all these three areas as ways that we would develop writing talent um, at home and at school. I just want you to take a minute and read this quote and then we'll talk a little bit about how this applies. So in last fall, I presented on front loading for developing writing talent for National Association for Gifted Children. And I was really thinking about those moments when we want to make an assessment before we've done any instruction. And what front loading says is do some instruction, build some capacity, and then do some assessing about next steps. Um, if you don't know her work, the, the author of this quote, Reggie Routman, is a veteran voice in literacy in both developing reading and writing skills. And I love that she, um, even though she doesn't necessarily work in gifted education, but she's really thinking about front loading as well. I felt like this was just a really good fit for our work tonight. Um, okay, so part one of the evidence triangle means. And, and the means to write, for me, starts with notebooks. So every, I love these, oh, they're so cute. So every writer needs a notebook. Um, a lot of us have routines for decorating them. I, I go back and forth. This is just, I like the cover of mine. It's just kind of fancy. Um, and then it does say, you are amazing on the inside of it, which I find very affirming. And I, I tend to go through about a notebook a year. This is a notebook that I, I use when I'm teaching. So I'm always carrying it around with me. And when I'm teaching and I'm also writing, this is the one that I use. Um, every writer I know has some place where they keep ideas. If they don't write them down, they keep them on voice memo, et cetera. But this is a step one, and I and I and a lot of writers. When I'm working with teachers and teacher writers, we talk about what are the routines and rituals around your notebook. Um, the next thing that people always ask about is pencil or pens. I, I have zero feelings about that. Kids have feelings about that, and teachers have feelings about it. This also goes with the writing in cursive question. None of that worries me. It's just about writing. And then um, the next question I often get is around a, um, tech. So. Usually I like people to start in notebooks and especially in this moment in our world when so much is digital and so much is keyboard, it's really nice to have an analog option where your brain isn't looking, your eyes aren't on the screen. However, there are some students that they need adaptive technology 
and that's the main mode that they'll be using for composing. But sometimes with a paraprofessional, they might want to still do some jotting in a notebook or some drawing. So I like everyone to have a notebook um, regardless. Uh, there is an author in the NL community named Pintip Dunn, and Pintip has an extreme version of carpal tunnel syndrome, and she dictates all of her books and then edits them on her phone because the tiny phone keyboard doesn't trigger her carpal tunnel the way a full keyboard was. So hear me say, I don't have any you know, final say one or the other, it's what works best for you, but I think it's really nice to have both an analog and a digital option. One other thought because our students are very crafty and technology savvy, I like to hesitate for a little while, like them to be writing or just um, noodling around on paper for a while, because sometimes students who are building towards engagement will just open another tab and play like that dinosaur game or the chicken game instead of writing. So it's just, <laughs> when we're first practicing, I like everyone, that's another reason. That's just me teaching a long time, but I really like everyone to have pencil and paper as an option. And as I, so I started with writer's notebooks, and then I started to think about, can the absence of something be a barrier to learning? So obviously not having technology, not having a notebook, that's a barrier. But the thing that I perceived was missing that it took me a little while to name was community. So if you just think for a minute, like what is, how does community even show up as it relates to writing or writing in a classroom? So just give you a second to think about that. Pretty much every writer I know, every professional working writer I know, has is part of a writing group, whether it's a small one or a large one, or people that you can text or people that you can talk writing with. Um, because this is a, a lonely business. Writing is, by definition, almost always solitary. Um, so with professional writers, it's really nice to have other people to kind of just kick some stuff around with. But in the classroom, I want you to think about it like this. Writing is both creative art, it's producing art, and it's also an academic skill. If I am showing you my art, I am taking a personal risk. What we forget about sometimes is that if I'm showing you my academic writing, where I've gone out of limb and taken a very specific position or used very personal to me evidence that I feel strongly about to support my thinking, I'm still taking a risk. And that is very hard for students who are struggling or reluctant, and certainly for some of our gifted learners who have some elements of perfectionism. As I started to think about that, I thought about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, because of course we want our students to have their you know, physiological needs met, but look where creativity is. It's at the very top of Maslow's. It says all of my other needs met, including belongingness and esteem, the, and, and my sense of accomplishment, those are all underneath to support me moving into that creative space. So in my mind, when I don't have that in my own writing community, whether it's my classroom or home or my, you know, my fellow writers, I may not be putting myself out there and really stretching myself into my full growth as a writer. Similarly, here's another triangle to look at, which is Green's taxonomy. I've been thinking about this a lot because I'm in right in the heavy creative mode. Well, I often am. I write, as, as she said, I do write every single day. I finished two books in 12 months this year. One is 85,000 words and one is 60,000 words, which is a lot. Um, and I, because I do work full time and have children. Um, but look where create is, is again at the very top. So this is a great place for our students to be, for our gifted learners to be, because you know how hard their brain is working. But look at all the things that have to be in place for that creativity to really be accessible. Um, I think sometimes with writing, unlike other art, so so we would, maybe maybe you would, and and I, but in my mind, I don't think people would be like, you just sit down and paint a masterpiece, and you haven't done all these other things in art class or whatever. But quite often, we're like, and write, and just go, and then it's going to be something that potentially you'd be judged on. And so I just wanted to remind us, I know that you know this, but think about Maslow's Next to Bloom's helps me think more about really the why of the structure of a classroom and the writing community to help our students feel ready to take those writing risks. Okay, so if you've got a notebook, you have a community, you've got some routines and structures around your writing, well, why would you write? So, this is, um, I did a session a couple of years ago at, at our CCIRA conference, Colorado um, Council for, or chapter of the International Reading Association. And my um, 
thesis was that genre fiction is the cure for I hate to write ideas. Because very often I will go to a school and someone will tell me, a student or a teacher, that they hate writing. And I say, oh, okay, do you hate writing about vampires? And they're like, what did you just say? I'm like, oh, did you, do you hate writing about, do you hate writing about like fart jokes? Which is really awesome to ask a fifth grade boy because they're like, did you just say fart at school? But you, right? Or do you hate to write about soccer? Do you hate to write about dragons? Usually you're going to get to something that they don't hate. Um, and then, and then you're in, right? There's the motivation. Um, so, so, so to kind of expand on this idea, I want you to think about in a, in a classroom or in a home, in a community, the most physical, tangible evidence that someone was writing is in, is it a book? It's the library. It's in the bookstore. It's in your bookshelves at home. And so when we ask students to write things that don't make sense, don't logically connect to that, it starts to feel kind of fake to them. Like, why, what's this writing have to do with, because that's what writing for a job looks like. See that there's books. Um, there are a few, the main one, Lucy Calkins is the one that talks about we are making books, but a lot of other writing um, programs that are out there are these sort of discrete bits of writing that aren't necessarily directly linked. Whereas genre fiction is, I can point, there's the mystery section, there's the horror section, there's sports fiction, and that that one-to-one -one can really be motivating for students sometimes. Or you can think of it like this. If you let your writers write what they want to read, all of a sudden, they're very excited to write it. And I am extremely flexible about what writers write. Basically, my only rule is, as long as it's okay for school, I do define what is okay for school based on the age of the students, and I have a couple other roles, but um, only four, because I, I can't really remember more roles than that. Um, but basically, when you're letting writers write what they want to read, um, everybody writes. And I used to like whisper that, like I was worried that I would get struck by lightning if I had so much hubris to say, kids don't say no to this, but I can tell you now, with hundreds and hundreds of hours in classrooms, kids will write. And the things that they want to write are usually quite interesting. Um, I was thinking the other day that I was in a classroom talking about fan fiction, and this fourth grade boy was like, okay, okay, all right, you know that movie, that hockey movie, Miracle? I'm gonna like write that, but with dinosaurs. And I was like, yes, I, I would totally read that book. Like dinosaurs and ice skating, I'm so there for this. And I get lots of like, well, I've been watching X-Files with my dad and I could, I could try some X-Files fan fiction. Like I just, and I'm like, yeah, I love X-Files. And, and as a teacher, the more that you can say, or mom, the more you can say yes to, the more sort of that enthusiasm and potential you start to build in your community. So I always give kids a survey and I just, in case the teachers in the room are like, I don't know, like, I'm not sure about that. Well, here's a hundred and a sample of 138 students, and you can see that the number one choice they made was crime. So interesting, crime fiction. Um, I didn't choose that bicycle photo by accident. Um, followed by humor, and then notice that fantasy and horror are tied, and then science fiction. So it's so funny because I gave them like all these choices, and they could write things in. Um, but by far, and that's a pattern that I've seen over the last four years, humor fantasy and crime are nearly always the top three with horror and science fiction kind of coming in fourth and fifth usually. Um, and I just, as, as teachers, and we think about your book room and your bookshelf, the majority of it might be contemporary realistic or what, you, what was once contemporary realistic um, and then historical fiction. So kids often don't choose those because they feel like they're really familiar and they have a sense of like kind of how that works as they read more. But these are the things that are dominant in television, dominant in film, and feel like something that, yeah, I really want to know how to do that. Okay, <laughs> but like, how do you do that? Says this curious basset hound. Great, great question. When I first was trying to do this in my own classroom, I had no tools, but I knew I wanted to do writer's workshop, and I knew I wanted to do genre study, and here was the idea that came to my rest. It's this simple rule. You, you study the thing that you want to make. So Katie would pray her book, Study Driven, which is on my list of resources. She basically talks you through how do you, how, how do you study the thing you want to make? How does a writer study writing the way an art student studies art? And I thought, oh, okay. And then the whole book is mostly like examples of things that she studied with her students and kind of how they did it. And you can very much see a pattern. So then me as a fledgling writing teacher, I was following that pattern. And then over time, as I got to know 
professional writers and learn how writers tell it writers, then I could really take my game to the next level in my teaching game. Let me give you some examples. So here are three genres, the top three, fantasy, crime, and humor. Pretty much everyone that works in schools knows about the Warrior series by Aaron Hunter, and there are literally three, four dozen books in the series at this point, and they have a very visible pattern. Uh, how the conduct of the book is introduced, how we talk about the different wildcat clans and where they live, how we talk about the different like action moments, usually it's battles, and then like the personal, like individual struggles versus the group struggles, and then how it's res how, how the resolution happens. So kids who consume these books you can say, oh, have they gotten to the big battle yet? And then the, the, the reader will say, oh yeah, it's eh, probably in a couple more chapters. Because they know, because they've read 30 of the 48 Warriors books or however many there are. Um, Agatha Christie, while it is written for adults, it's generally quite sanitized. There's very little cussing. Any murder that happens generally happens off the page before chapter one starts. And there's very little physical interaction, kissing or otherwise in the books. I tend to find my middle school students who are interested in mystery. I mean, there are good middle grade and young adult mysteries, and we can, but some of those are on my resource list. But Agatha Christie has such a pattern. And that's, that's how you study the thing you want to make. How does it start? Who's in the opening scene? How do we know, how do we know if the crime is stopped or not? How do, we, how do, how do the clues appear? Like, um, I was telling Miranda about a book I just finished. And one of the places authors love to hide clues or things we're going to use later is in lists. So in this room was a this, a this, and a this, but maybe the middle this was an antique revolver and you think to yourself, hmm, that revolver might come in into a scene later. Um, you know that from Chekhov, there's a writer rule called Chekhov's gun. He said, the playwright Chekhov said, if you hang a gun on the mantle in act one, you better be using it by act three, right? So that's a pattern in mystery. And then Dire Wimpy Kid, also beloved, also a clear pattern. And once you start to like, just, just, the kids who are high potential, the writers who are high potential, just putting that out, they're like, oh yeah, okay. And then you say, all right, so if you're gonna try that on your own, like start with that pattern and then start filling it in with your own story ideas. And that takes a lot of the, um, it's only for fancy people who have books on the bookstore shelves. No, every writer starts somewhere. If you have students who um, through some unusual twist of statistics do not like these three as their top genre, here are some other things that kids are really interested in. Fan fiction. Oh my gosh. Um, later, and I don't know if it's on my resource list, I can add it. There's a, the biggest fan fiction site is called An Archive of Our Own, or AO3, if you are cool. And it is really um, an interesting true archive of fan fiction of literally every fandom possible. Fan fiction has tons of structure because you're just writing within the canon world of whatever the thing is. So I always tell people it's kind of like bowling with the bumpers on because basically you have pretty good luck getting that ball down to the pins or in this case, writing a story that has established characters and established world and established plot. And you're just getting to practice like tension or dialogue or action with all that other stuff already established and not having to create it on your own. So a lot of writers I know, fan fiction is a great place to start. Technical writing is something I've been thinking about a lot because in my mind, Next to books in a school, the most professional writing students come in contact with is on websites. And oh my gosh, there are there's a lot of good technical writing out there that people do for a job. I think that's another disconnect we often have with our writers around that motivation piece is that they think, why would I do this? Why will I ever need this? And they don't think to themselves, writing could be a job. And certainly, technical. I think a lot of kids think that like the internet wrote a website or like a robot they don't have like a, a human had to go talk to all the engineers at the car company to ask them what is different about this propulsion system or what is different about the the audio and then they had to take all the facts they got from the car designers and they had to put it into words that people who aren't car designers would understand and that is actually a super cool job especially if you like cars but you're not an engineer there's there's that and then another, um, the fastest growing genre in publishing right now is narrative nonfiction in every age, picture book to adult. Kids are just hungry for a real story. They love based on a true story. We love it in sports, we love it in history, we love it in contemporary. And oh my, like there's a local author who wrote a picture book about Les Paul, um, the guitarist and guitar inventor. 
And that was wildly popular. Kids want to know that information. They want to know about a real person who had a real life who did extraordinary things. Um, also patterns here, lots of cool stuff that kids would be willing to try, especially your kids who are like not into fiction at all. They would love the chance. And that would be maybe what would motivate them because they don't want to write about their feelings and they don't want to write literary analysis, but they would be really interested to write the technical specs of this kind of skateboard versus that kind of skateboard. Or they would like to tell you about why Tony Hawk was the OG of skateboarding, you know, and, and what, right? So, so just, just, just be thinking about other options that might be motivating to writers who otherwise wouldn't have been telling you that they don't like writing. Okay, so before we move on from this section, this is a technique I like to try. I would like you to write down some really terrible ideas. Um, well, a lot of times what happens with writers who are like maybe starting to become motivated, like I could maybe do that. They're like, ah, oh, my ideas are stupid though. And I'm like, okay, good. Please write down all of your stupid ideas. And then once you have a list of bad ideas for a story or a narrative nonfiction or a piece of technical writing, put a star by the worst one. So I'll just give you a minute. I'm going to jot down some bad ideas too. They can be in any of the genres we talked about or um, and remember, they do have to be okay for school. So please don't put anything in the chat that is above PG-13 because this is a family show. But I want you to write down some bad ideas. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna write some bad ideas too. For the sake of time, I'm going to keep going. Some of you might be thinking, well, all of my ideas are bad. And, and usually what happens is I'll have kids share these out. And I'm like, actually, I would read that. Or that's really interesting. Or actually, there's already a movie about that. And, and it's just this fun kind of group validating, like back to that community piece where we all can kind of laugh. Like what someone thinks is a terrible idea, someone else is like, that'll make a million dollars. And I'll give you an example that writers talk about all the time. And that is the movie, Snakes on a Plane. <laughs> right? Like it seems like a pretty stupid idea. But it was a fairly successful movie. So just, you know, keep thinking about that. The last part of the evidence triangle is opportunity. This is something that I see as a challenge in schools a lot. Um, so you might have got your gorgeous decorative notebooks and, and routines and structures and kids are ready to rock. You might have some super cool ideas and kids are ready to go with narrative nonfiction or with fan fiction or they're all going to write crime. And you guys, and then you start to build some routines around these things like drafting and conferring. But then what happens is we don't protect that time for all the reasons, all the school reasons. Um, and you might, the kids would be like, but I want to write. And um, the teacher's like, oh, we were going to write, but we have to have this happen or this happen. Um, I was teaching at a school and the plan was I was there once a week and the kids would be working on whatever the mini lesson was, the days I wasn't there. And then I come back the following week and they report their progress. So after a few weeks, I was like, hey guys, how's the writing going? And like a bunch of heads go to the teacher and they're like, we never write unless you're here. And I was like, oh no, we got to figure this out because it's not okay to set kids up to get excited to write and then we, then we don't build in the time. So some thoughts about that. I have, I'd like to see 70 minutes a week of writing. Now, to me, that doesn't sound like that much, but here's the math. In middle school and high school, we have usually blocks of about 45 minutes of time, so 70 minutes out of that. Or in elementary school, we often have like a 90 minute literacy block. So again, 70 minutes total across the whole week. And what I mean by the physical act of writing is kind of what we just did earlier with the bicycle and just quick our jot list. So we are uh, you're using your pen or pencil on paper or your hands on a keyboard. So you're not talking about writing, you're not doing a worksheet about writing, you're not writing in response to reading, you're writing, you're following up your own story idea or studying or with the genre that we're working on. So kind of here's my plan for the year of fan fiction, then about 90 weeks of genre fiction, then we go into narrative nonfiction and technical writing until winter break. And then I know the teachers are like, what? All we do is persuasion and claims evidence reasoning. And I hear you, but the teachers, I mean, the students have gotten that by now because we've been practicing that for like six years. So my argument is, if you've taught all your narrative tools, you've built all this writing stamina, because when you're doing this, and I'll show you the next thing in a minute, kids are building stamina to write 25, 45 minutes at a time. When you get to argument, it is so much easier, and they're ready. They're ready, and they trust you, because you've earned their trust, and they're, you're like, we had all this choice, and now I, there is some writing I need you to do for school. 
you know, prepping for this reason. Then you review fan fiction before state testing it here in Colorado. It's the Colorado Measures of Academic Success. If you're in a park or even a smarter balance state around the US, um, one of your prompts will basically be fan fiction. So ping me and I'll tell you more about that. But anyway, you study that. And then this is how it breaks down by the week. So four days of 10 minutes or 15 minutes of a physical act of writing, except for Friday. And I would love for you to give, well, I like Fridays, but one day we could love you to give writing a little bit more time. This is when kids just direct their own writing. Um, and then you as the teacher are conferring. So the other three days, I'm always writing too, at least part of the time. And then the one day that everyone is free writing or whatever they want to work on when they're writing, I should say, that's when I'm really purposely conferring. And I have some very specific conferring routines I do. Once you've kind of got that all done and you've done with whatever your required testing is, you've kind of got these free spaces on your bingo card to do the things that really aren't in the standards anymore, but that you might really love. That's how I, that's how I think about it. When teachers are really telling me, but what about, what about, I'm like, absolutely. This is kind of how those would fit in. But I, I, the, the standards I was talking with a colleague in my district group today, standards are a common floor. All the things that I just showed you are all deeply aligned to the standards. The things on this screen aren't as much. And so that's why I like to do them in the free space, in the free spaces. Last thing we're gonna talk about is kind of about how this shows up at home. And you might be living with a gifted writer, a high potential writer, and what might you see? So um, our gifted writers are really good storytellers. Um, they read all the time. They might be amazing liars. I, I live with one of those. Um, and so how do you harness that into writing a home? Um, so kind of back to that thing about studying and getting excited and thinking about patterns. That's that creative potential building into curiosity, but you want to give that some time to build. Like if one day your child says, I want to write a novel, and you're like, good, sit right down and write. That doesn't work because you haven't built all that potential yet. You haven't created curiosity. You haven't studied how things are made. Um, I love this quote. I often ask my fellow writers, you know, how did you get started? Or what happened at home that worked for you? Or what happened at school? So Stephanie's found as an author based in Chicago. And I love, this just made sense to me. So she said, my mom always asked her about what she was reading, what she liked. Same with music and movies. And I highlight the part that really I think fits with our conversation tonight is when you talk about a thing, sometimes it leads to asking how they are made and how we then can make our own thing. And that's just such a cool thing to have as a conversation as a family. And here's a great quote from one of America's foremost creators, Lynn Manuel Miranda. Um, to have just a little bit of time alone, like that, that analog time, just to just sort of noodle and daydream and research and wonder. Um, I think about it from a gardening metaphor, like I feel like I'm mulching all these ideas in my brain for the time when I can go to my next story. Um, so the last thing I'm going to show you is something, a game that we like to play as a family. Um, I have also done this with students, so I'm like, here's regular people, and I want you to make up a story about them. A nice story, an okay for school story, but it's okay to lie, because your real literal students will be like, but that's a lie. And I'm, then I always say, well, writers make up stories about real and imaginary people for a job. <laughs> and, and all the liars make kids who make up stories are like, yes, I finally arrived in my career. So I'm just going to show you kind of how we would do this as a family. We look at a group of people and I was like, what, tell me about this person or this person in the middle of this gardening photo. You know, she's the one in the middle. She's picking yellow flowers. I'm super curious about this person back here by the microwave because these folks up front have some kind of interesting looking sauce going on. So I'm like, what's, what's my microwave person doing? And then um, this person over here uh, with the arrow, um, I don't know about you guys, but like one of the things my dad taught me how to do was immediately tell if someone's left-handed, so see how her watch is on the right hand. So I might start my piece of writing about her, how she's left-handed, and then go into how she feels about the different colors or sticky notes in the meeting. It's just a fun, like a mental exercise and game to play. Um, someone to talk about who would be fun to write about. I cannot believe this amazing, image I the internet gave me of robot parents. Um, but here's some things that we like to think about. Um, I will call out in case people are wondering, older citizens with special skills, now this is, sorry, this is a rated R example, but there was a, a, um, two films, R.E.D., which stood for Retired Extremely Dangerous, starring Bruce Willis, and it is completely about older citizens. They're all like retired secret agents, and it's super fun and funny, people who are allowed to watch rated R movies. But anyway, 
And then something else I've been thinking about a lot lately, especially during quarantine, is if my kitchen appliances are judging me, and like maybe that would be a fun story to write. So as a parent, you're supporting your people. Okay, some of us think through writing. That's all we do. We're not gonna write novels, but it's just writing helps us think. Some of us explain that might be that technical writer, that might be that student who has got just cool logic and they can walk you through. And then some of us imagine through writing. And all of those are ways that writing potential can truly develop. So I've given you a list of resources. Here's a bit.ly, and Maria's gonna post it in the chat. This is Nathan Fillion as the writer Richard Castle, which is a super fun TV show. All the crime TV shows have a pattern, and I know you know it. Um, but yeah, this is a fun one. And we, we, all the writers <laughs> love that he gets his own, you know, Kevlar vest with the word writer on it. So that's the resource for you. Um, Marina's going to put that in there, and I'm going to show you. It's just a list that looks like this. Um, so you get these resources here, some of the teaching books I was talking about, a video for helping kids learn how to write dialogue, some community resources, and then some mentor texts by some other genres that we talked about for both middle grade, which would be like that third through seventh grade, and then young adult. Um, if you need more picture book and early reader examples, I'm building out that list of mentor texts now. I should have it hopefully in the next couple of days and I can share it with Kaiti and, and then we can add it to the resources for this session. Can you pop back to the bit.ly? For, perfect, okay. Right. So here's the bit.ly. And then the last, um, Oh, i sorry, I talk longer. I practiced. I wasn't talking fast enough, I guess. But we have time for 15 minutes for questions. Yes? Yes, we do. So I just want to make sure I got the bit.ly right. And it's, it's posted in the, in, the, uh, in the chat. And I'm going to see yeah. if I can uh, pin it okay. to the top. So it'll be at the top of the chat as well. Perfect. So my book that's coming out in April does not have a cover yet. So I made a cover. This is the title. Um, it should be out hopefully April of 21. I'm so excited about it. Um, everything, so everything we just talked about has its own chapter in the book. And at the end of every chapter is next steps for struggling or reluctant writers and next step for gifted writers. And this is the only book about writing that does this. And believe me, I have looked and looked and looked. So if you find one, let me know because I want to use it as a comp and share it all with you as a resource. And then the last chapter is specifically about identifying gifted writers. So I'm, I'm just, so thrilled to have had the opportunity to write it um, and so thrilled that it's coming out in less than a year. Um, and so knowing all the things that you know and knowing how much you care about the writers and why you're writing other writers in your family, the writers in your classroom, I have confidence that you're ready to go to the next step and keep developing that potential. Here is my contact information one more time and it is time for questions. So yay. Okay, awesome. I have a fly. Like when are they going to talk? Sorry. I wasn't sure. That was like a salute. Like, yes. No, that's just me, like, is, will it freeze already? <laughs> Where are these flies? Okay, so we do have, I'll, I'm gonna, I want you to leave up there for a few minutes um, your information, and then you can stop Absolutely. sharing it for a few minutes if you want to. Okay. Um, so we do have a few questions. Um, and, you know, I want to highlight a couple things you talked about, about writing community. And I feel like you make a really good point about um, having a group of people who, who support you in that task, because as it's also a risk to be a writer in yes. school and it's a risk to put your writing out there. And I think of, um, who's it when um, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, didn't she come up with the idea like sitting in, in a, in a storm in an old manor with her like cousins or whatever, like a whole bunch of writers. Yeah. Yes. Um, speaking Lord of writer writer. nonfiction, Mary Shelley has a fascinating story that is technically not okay for school. <laughs> but yes, she had um, her boyfriend and other friends who were part of that Gothic, kind of that re they were a rebellion, the Gothic writers rebelling against yes. what was being written at the time. And yeah, so, and they were talking about art and science and, and that's supposedly where the idea came from. Right, and she probably and would have come up with Frankenstein in isolation, you know, she, that yeah. community is what helped spur that, and, and Frankenstein's a seminal piece of literature, you know, and, and it it's, it's very much analyzed, so I think community is great, and having kids talk about their writing and share their ideas, so I just wanted to reiterate that, because I yeah, think sometimes we let, make writing seat work, and yes. sometimes it should be collaborative work, so. Yeah, just so you can kick ideas around, that's one of my most favorite games to play with my writer friends, is I'll be like, okay, 
So I have this idea and then we kind of like workshop the idea a little bit and that's just, it's invaluable. So yeah. Awesome. So I, I wanted to reiterate that because I thought that was a great um, thing we need to remember as educators. Um, mm -hmm. So Michelle Barkmeyer, uh, she's uh, the Western Slope representative for CAG-T. Hi, Michelle. Michelle. Um, and she actually said she wants to know where you come up with your ideas for your stories. <laughs> so um, Michelle, uh, I'm so glad you asked. And Michelle and I are friends, so she's been with me when I'm out. I'm like making up stories about people that I see. <laughs> so um, I feel like story ideas are everywhere. And I actually, that's my the main bulk of my Twitter feed is I, I read an article from like Smithsonian and I'm like, oh, that's a really cool story idea. Um, so for example, and I also read all of the New York Times science section. I get it like either compiled and emailed to me every week. So last year there was an article called something like, scientists are reanimating mammalian brains. What could go wrong? And I was like, <laughs> we know, right? So, and um, there was a story a couple of years ago about in, there's a province in China where in order to become a firefighter, you have to pass a bravery test and the bravery test is you have to sleep overnight in the cemetery. And I was like, what? So I, I feel like story ideas are everywhere. So I, but I, I try to read pretty widely across science and history, um, geography, social science. And, and then I just kind of file all those things away um, either in my brain or on social media, depending if I'm worried I'll lose track of it. Um, one thing that happens a lot with writers is we get a lot of ideas. I think writers are like magpies. We're always collecting like shiny things and putting them in our nest. And what some of your gifted writers will do, I'm thinking of when I read last year, is all, every idea sparks the beginning of a new story, but it might just be a couple of pages. And one of the things you have to go into as a writer is testing when an idea could carry the weight of an entire story or novella or novel. And you can't abandon the thing that you're under contract to write because you got distracted by something shiny. So I, all, every writer I know, including me, we keep a file called shiny new ideas. Like my friend Donna, one day, I don't remember how it came up, but she's saying that she had a job in high school of keeping statistics for the football team. And I was like, can I have that for a story? And she was like, sure. So I put it in my new ideas file. Um, and then another person I work with, her mother told her one time, I, I need you to get a tattoo, which is unusual because usually moms don't say that, but the mom followed it up with, so that if something happens to you, we can identify your body. <laughs> and I was like, oh, can I have that for a story? Like, so I think it's how my brain is trained now, Michelle, is that everything could be a story idea and I'm constantly collecting them and thinking about how they might show up. Um, I was talking to my family the other night, and I'll start answering the question, but like, um, one of my favorite characters in my books is a character named Fentress, and I saw that name on a waitress's name tag. Like, that was lit. I don't remember the waitress, but I remember thinking, that is the coolest name, and like writing it down somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's about observing. I think it's about being curious, and I think it's about being a storyteller. That's where my ideas come from. So thank you for asking. I love it. Um, okay, so then um, Duran uh, Turner asked, um, kind of like how, along the lines of getting students engaged in writing, part of that is increasing representation um, yes. for our diverse students. So how can we increase yes. representation? Um, I know we've talked about, you know, in other, in other conversations about representation in, in the novels that they read and the stories that they read, but how do we increase representation in writing instruction and curriculum? It's such a, thank you for asking that. So the mentor text that will be in my in my book that's coming out in the spring. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, I, I made a commitment that half of the mentor authors would be biracial indigenous authors of color so that uh, we made sure that we had a broad representation across the mentor text. And then the other thing that when I'm talking specifically more about what you're asking is I say make sure how the represent how, how students are represented. So not just that they're represented but how a given group is represented. For example, something I say to teachers, because you know, it costs money to update your classroom library, but I say, look, if, if Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry is the only book in your classroom with an African-American student, on, a person on the front of it, it's time you've got to update. Because 
that share path or representation isn't in any way, it's a tiny fraction of the amazing stories that are out there. Go get told on a blood and bone. I mean, go get, oh, <laughs> um, you should see Unit Crown by Leah Johnson. I mean, there's so many books that are coming out that are Slay by Brittany, that, they're just, there's a broken handle, but anyway, think about who's on your shelf, think about who's on the covers, think about who wrote those stories and how people are represented. And then one of the things that I really love is that in our writing community, I'm thinking about um, National Novel Writing Month, Jason Reynolds and Marie Liu are two of the um, mentor voices. There's videos by other authors of color. Um, I'm thinking of like Before He Died, the wonderful Walter B. Myers, um, did, a, did a pep talk for NaNoWriMo. So, and there's lots of places you can find video and text of those writers encouraging students to tell their own stories. So I think it's finding the working writers, having an updated mental text in your classroom. And then I think it's that gentle encouragement around what feels safe of your own story to tell or what you're not ready to share. So it's back that community part. Um, some students aren't ready, some really are. Oh, another great resource is um, our own Denver Pop Culture Con has started a series of comics that represent the diverse experiences that are, I live in Denver, that are based here in Denver, and those are free. So I will look for the link and get that to you also, Miranda, but um, I, I think when we think about how students are represented, and I, of course, my brain always goes to picture books and novels, but comics is another great place to engage students and to look for really positive representation. So thank you for that question. It's very near and dear to my heart. Awesome. And that was, took lots of notes on that. Okay, thank you. I'll make sure, uh, yeah, I'm like, oh, and more resources. And yeah. which of you know me, like, that's one of my love languages. I'm like, and here's another resource. And here's five more articles. And I just like to help you know stuff so that you can also know the things that we, we want, we should know. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always like, hey, I read this great article. I send links to my friends and they're like, this is the Atlantic and it's probably seven pages long. We're gonna pass it. I know, right? <laughs> I know they don't read them. What? I'm, I'm like, one of them is watching right now. No. Okay. Um, another, um, and you kind of covered this topic. Do you have suggestions okay. for parents to encourage and nurture writing at home? So you talked about some of those conversations to have around the, around the dinner table and uh, noticing and stuff, but any other um, quick tips or, or ways to interject um, um, those kind of, that support at home. Yeah, so something that um, teachers and parents, we do when we're reading with our children, whether we're reading together or partner reading or listening to books together, is that we tend to admire writing if it's fireworks. You know, like, ooh, ah. So that's cool. But shift your conversation to how. Like, I wonder how, like, um, my daughter and I have been partner reading the Apollo books by Rick Rubin, one of his newer series. And there's a moment where a really important character dies, and it's it is a it is gut wrenching, right? And so we we could say, how did he make us? How are we so upset right now? And we can look back once we're done being upset. Mm -hmm. We can look back at the how, and usually that foundation of that how has been brewing for a little while in the chapter, and when you get or or it catches you completely by surprise that one of the two. And you look at how to, what you know how that show up on the page. So, so instead of admiring it like a distance, like only one people, one or two people can do that, and bring it back to the craft. So the gut check moments are a really good thing to do as parents, um, for both humor and then other emotional responses. Just talk about just talk about the book a little bit differently and say like, I wonder how the author did that. Jokes are really fun to track down in the text. Usually the setup is again earlier pages, but sometimes it catches you by surprise. Humor is super hard to write, so it's fun to check into. Um, and then I also think like we were talking about like looking for patterns. Um, in yeah. in times of stress, and some I think would say that we're in one of those times now, you'll find your your children or your students wanting to read the same books over and over again because that pattern is really reassuring. So why not just talk about the pattern? What do you like about it? What do you notice? What's going to happen? Um, do you know any other books that have that pattern? And again, kind of gets about craft and the choices that authors make versus it's just good. Yeah. I like that. I think, you know, it's how we cannot, we can't really separate the reading and the writing in that way. No, you know? no, no. My dear friend Bob Sneed and I have had some really wonderful conversations about that. And he has this great quote, and I'm not going to get it right, but something like um, readers are born on their parents' laps. And then the, the following quote is, never a writer was made who wasn't a reader. Yeah. 
yeah and i think yeah i think studying the craft and studying those patterns and studying that kind of stuff it also helps and you know i think when we talk about illusion with students illusion isn't possible unless you're well read <laughs> right because you wouldn't know that that's a hamlet reference or a bible reference or a mark twain reference you would just be like okay <laughs> yeah yeah well and then i think you know illusion is necessary you know like in, in some ways for some complexity of your writing as well so i yes. think you know, being a good yes, writer. I will tell you a lot of writers will do that by accident. And then someone will say, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, like maybe that was back in the mulch somewhere. And I just right? forgot. <laughs> it becomes like subconscious and just comes out that way. Sometimes, like, sometimes it's very much on purpose. And Michael K. Thompson always says like, no great writer ever did, did anything by accident. But I think some of those deeper layers of interpretation mm -hmm. maybe are more from the writer's unconscious mind. Yeah, That's for sure. Thing to that too. Shelly asks, um, what is, so we have two questions left. We're going to wrap up and we'll have two questions left. So Shelly's question is, um, you're a teacher in a classroom. What is the best way, if you were to say like one way to really jumpstart developing writing talent in the classroom, how would you, how would you start? So I would start by, like I showed you my list, I would give the kids a survey and say, what do you want to learn? And I would give them maybe even like with littler guys, like pick covers, like here's the cover of Miss Nelson is Missing, here's the cover of Alexander and the Horrible Terrible Day, here's the cover of Creepy Carrots, which is a really fun book. Oh, and I just found a new humor picture book called 17 Things I'm Not Allowed to Do Anymore, which is as funny as it promises. Um, and I would say, which one of these do you want to try to learn how to do? And I would kind of like so we combine it with that admiring with that choice and then we would then we would practice and play I, I i use the i use verbs like practice and play and invite a lot um so that's probably how i would start if, if i had older students i would probably start with fan fiction um because it is so accessible and everyone has a story that they're mad about that ending was not right or that is not those characters are not the ones who are supposed to end up together or that character wasn't supposed to die everyone has something in their lives they have things about and I know this because last year I received a very serious lecture from a young man about Dragon Ball Z and he had feelings about what needed to be fixed and I was like I can't wait for you to, to, to rectify that and please let me know how it's going right so those are kind of the two places I would start depending on the age of the students um I had a lot of kids really angry about Allegiant oh yeah I was mad about it too I was too throw the book at the wall I can't oh, even yeah what you do? <laughs> no, no, and and um, another in fan fiction, there's a thing called shipping, which is short for relationship. And it's when you put the two characters who you think should be together in a relationship, and you write those like dating scenes because you're like, you know, I'm just gonna call it out. Like nobody thinks that Hermione was supposed to end up with Ron. Sorry, Ron. If you're if you're a Harry Potter fan, a lot of people, some people ship Hermione with Draco, which is interesting. But um, a lot of people are like, obviously, Harry and Hermione should have been or a fan couple. And then they rewrite those scenes. So it's just or Katniss um, and um, Peta. Like, ugh. I was definitely yeah. not a. You were not, you were not team Peta. You were team Gale. That yeah, was, I was team right? Gale. Yeah, and so, certainly the Twilight, the Twihards, as they say, right? They, they all have feelings about that love triangle. And and for your kids who aren't into love triangles at all, but there's like the kids who have. I had a kid who wrote Minecraft fan fiction for like mm -hmm. eight solid weeks. And all the other Minecraft kids were like loving it. He was writing this. This was one of my students who was an English learner. And they'd be like, hey, what's Steve doing? Because you know Minecraft, you know the main character's name is Steve. And they'd be like, did he get in a sheep? Did he find any redstone? And then Irving, my student, was like so excited because he had this built-in audience of other Minecraft fans who were like, oh yeah. And then, and he's like, look, I'm, a, I'm building a roller coaster. <laughs> it was, yeah. no, What happens next? I know, exactly. And, and then, and that's that community part again. Yeah. Um, it's so I I just can't tell you. So I would start, those are so back to Shelly's question. Those are the two places I would start. Choice based on books kids really like, mm -hmm. especially for younger guys. Yeah. And then for my sort of fifth, sixth grade and up, I would start with fan fiction because they don't have to do the heavy lift of creating a world, creating characters. They're just practicing their craft and they're and they're making something right. Like they're fixing whatever the writers of Dragon Ball Z did incorrectly. Yeah. <laughs> and I apologize because I don't know. Some of you out there probably do, but I, I didn't retain all the information because if you've ever talked to a gifted kid who's obsessed with something, you get like a very high density of detail. Yes. And yeah, 
yeah, you, it's just intensity all out. And it's, yeah. like, but then this happened, this happened. You're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I see that you feel strongly about that. Yeah, that's what I said. They're like, okay, so what needs to happen? He said, well, this and this. And I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, once you write that, like, let me know. I can't wait to like hear more. Let me teach you more so she can, you know, send it to me. <laughs> yeah. And there's something, I think, I think also, like, I think with, with kids, there's something cathartic about fan fiction, you know? Yes. You know? Well, and I was, I don't know if I, so true story my older daughter is now writing fan fiction for money because oh. you can commission someone to write fix if you like their writing style you can be like hey i want a fic with this pairing i want a fic with this scene this battle that we only hear about but we never got to see and so my daughter's now currently taking commissions for fan fiction for um final fantasy is one of her fandoms with the video game so is that so you can make some money it could yeah. be a side hustle <laughs> for sure for sure i love that Anything, any way to like make it, make it real for them, you know? We have yeah. one more question. Sally okay. Diane Quick, she asks, can you please address writer's block? I can. So writer's block tends to happen for perfectionists because there, someone has told them with well-meaning intention that Christopher Paolini published his first novel when he was 15 or 14. Mm -hmm. And I see that when she was 17 and they, they're just paralyzed, like I'll never write as like them and I, and therefore I'm stuck. That's usually what happens with writer's block. Or back to that thing I was talking about with all the shiny ideas and they might have had this idea that seems so shiny, but it isn't actually enough to sustain a whole novel. So that's usually kind of the two places writer's block stems from um, in the classroom. So how I coach students through that is first of all, walk away from that idea, whatever it is, whatever the thing is that's stressing you out, you have to walk away from it, but we are gonna write something else. So it, uh, from a teacher move, it is not unlike the get back on the horse or like I was a competitive diver doing an inverse dive and I, <laughs> and, and when you do an inverse, you have to, you get points for being close to the board and I scraped open the back of my legs on the diving board and my coach was like, get up on the diving board right now or you will never dive again. So sad for me because chlorine hurts on scrapes. I got up and did the dive again, but I, I didn't get stuck. So when your students are feeling stuck, have them walk away from the writing for the day, like go get a drink of water, take a walk around the school. Um, can you go get me some paper cups from a teacher that's two hallways away? And then we'll come back to the writing tomorrow. As a writer, if the scene isn't working or I'm feeling stuck, I typically stick with whatever the thing is, but I come over here and I do something else. So I might work on a character interview. I might do a setting sketch, which usually involves me, my really horrible drawing along with me with words trying to explain like where this place is in space. So I stick with the story world, but I go to something else away from the scene that isn't working. Um, but I don't, I don't stop writing because writer's block is really, I try to help people think about it. It's really about a specific moment of stuckness in the writing or it's a big idea and a set of expectations. If it's this, that's something you're gonna have to unpack a little bit more with that child. Um, there is a book and it is on my list there, I think I'm looking at it on my shelf. It's called something like First Words and it's first drafts of people like Stephen King and Amy Tan and John Cheska. And it's a great one to have in your classroom because it shows like, look, here's a writer who's now made millions of dollars and this is what their first drafts look like. So just to help, normalize it all first drafts are a little bit awkward and ugly and eventually you're it's, you're going to get there we would never expect the writing to be perfect to start with so those are kind of the two places that i would go with writer's block hopefully sally that gets to your question but if not you can always contact me by my email and be like no jennifer this is the kind of writer's block i meant and then we can have another we can talk more i that was really helpful because i've always thought writer's block was just something you had to like wait out Mm -mm. No, get up and move. You need to walk away from it for one, physically, especially in these these times. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite questions to ask kids is, which is the best water fountain in this school? Because they all have an opinion. And you tell them to go to that water fountain and get a really nice long drink, and then you come back. Um, that usually helps a lot. <laughs> if it's paralyzing perfectionism, like I said, a little bit different conversation. But get up and yeah. moving always helps. Yeah. Well, very helpful. I um. I'm so happy with the tips and stuff that you shared. I love the triangle. I love the thoughts that you have here. I think they're going to be really helpful to support 
um, writing teachers in my district, I'm going to send them the link to this recording and I sent them the, the link to attend. So um, I'm excited to share. I'm excited to share your resource list. I think um, I love resources. I'm like, ooh, what else, what else can I, what else can I use for that? What else can I use for that? Um, you gave me several for a student of my own. So I'm really excited about that too. Um, sorry, my in-laws and my husband are calling. Don't you know I'm on the clock? <laughs> Um, I know, well, they're like, you're still going to get so I know, I know. They're like, it's past time. Um, I do want to remind our viewers that um, Jennifer is going to be presenting at our conference. So we're very excited about, about that. about writing. Huh? Not about writing, though. I'm talking about, I'm, I won't be talking about writing, though. I'm talking about t different things. Different but things. But I will be there. But if you mm -hmm. like your presentation, you'd probably like what else you, you have to share. So. Yeah, um, and, I think about this stuff all the time. Right. And I think uh, we've got several of our, of our conversations with CAG-T are going to be at the conference. We also have next week, we have um, Lindsay Reinert and Kimberly Schmidt. They're talking about equity, equitable practices and gifted identification, specifically with um, culturally and linguistically diverse students. And so make sure you turn in for that. I think our, our conversation about representation today is not just important in writing or reading, but it's also important in how we identify um, students um, for gifted services, especially in our state. So we are making progress, but we have work to do. So please tune in next week, same time, same place for that. And uh, Jennifer, thank you for taking time out of your evening to do this. I know we went a little long tonight, but I, I really value what you had to share. And um, well, thank you. And we're going to let everybody go and have their dinner or whatever else. And yeah. um, we will see you later. All right. I appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night. See you at conference. Yay! Thank you. Okay.